Normally we don't get to see this look until weigh-ins. Yeah. Why are you gracing us with this today? It's uh, part of the media. Uh, I've, I've been given an opportunity to showcase my, my war paint, talk a little bit more about it, and uh, just embrace being Paul Craig, which is pretty cool. Um, it does feel a little bit strange wearing it, and there's no final face-off. I don't get to do the whole pageantry thing where I get to be in somebody's face. So if there's any takers out there that want a shot of this, come and get some. <laughs> Not me. Everyone's pointing at me. No, thank you. Um, have you run into your opponent yet in the, here with the face done up? I haven't seen him today. Uh, I think we're pretty much coming to the end. I've uh, been here for about nine o'clock just doing uh, bits and bobs, but he'll see it. He'll see it coming. How long does it take to get that off at the end of the night? When I do it, it takes less time, but I imagine when a makeup artist does it, there's, there's a little bit there's a little bit nicety in it, so I imagine it's going to take a lot more uh, scrubbing to get off. One of the first times I ever did it was done by a makeup artist, and it ended up I had like a blue eye, like for the for the fight. So if you watch back my first fight against uh, Henrique de Silva, you can see I've got this nice blue eye. It just makes it sparkle. I bet that freaked your opponent out a little bit. <laughs> um, well, that's that's part of it, you know. Uh, Scottish people rock this paint when they're ready to go to battle or ancient Scottish people uh, so I'm, I'm carrying that tradition on when the Scots are ready to go to battle we rock it we've seen Chris Duncan rock it as well so definitely starting a trend so can you talk to me a little bit about this fight week compared to last the last fight week that was your first one at middleweight how is it feeling now do you feel like you've gotten into a groove yet yeah although it was my first time making middleweight it was Officially, I had already made it prior to that. I'd made it twice just to make sure that the cut, we were able to function and perform at our best ability. Because the last thing you want to be doing is spending all this time during fight camp making the cut and then you can't perform. So we've made it a few times. Um, we had the gold standard in London and that's the way we've been running this kind of thing. So if we can hit all the same numbers, all the same uh, milestones, then we'll be able to make middleweight and perform at the best of your abilities. Right now, we're bang on the money. We are setting a gold standard. With regards to everything else, like speed, power, uh, all these attributes that help me be an athlete, they are through the roof at the moment. Everything is going so much better than it was in the previous camp. Um, so it's a, a positive place to be as a fighter. Do you wish maybe you had made that move sooner, or do you feel like the timing was perfect? I've, I've thought about this a lot. Being a 35-year-old man, you know, I've, uh, I've seen some things, done some things, I've got some experience, I've learned my lessons through doing certain things. If I was a 25-year-old version of myself, I don't think I'd have the discipline or the commitment or the, the drive and determination that I had, I have now. So I think it's came at the right time. And I know it's like hindsight, like, oh, how good would it have been to be a middleweight as a young up-and-coming prospect? Now, how good is it to be a middleweight as a 35-year-old Berdew? That's more scarier than a 25-year-old Paul. Can you talk to me about uh, your opponent? What do you think of the matchup? I think it's a great matchup. Like, very rarely do you get the UFC making bad matchups or you look at a card and go, oh, he's losing or he's winning. The UFC match make it so well, and when it comes to the night, it, it, it's what makes the shows so great. Uh, this is one of these battles where a lot of people are saying, like, it's going to be a grappling battle. I don't believe that. I believe this battle is going to be very much a stand-up battle. Who's going to control the distance? Who's going to control the octagon? And then from that, who's going to capitalise with these heavy shots? imposing damage, imposing will, and then from that, it will be then ended on the ground. So it will be one on the feet, ended on the ground. And, you know, I know that as a fighter, you're going to get criticism from fans, you're going to get criticism from the media, and even other fighters, but there was a recent interview with Moicano where he said that you had terrible striking. And I'm wondering what your thoughts are, if you have a message for him, but also how different it is to hear criticism from somebody who actually fights. Yeah, you know, when, when fighters or MD gives you any criticism, you obviously want to show them that they're wrong. But until you've had any of this smoke, like, you can't just sit there, regardless of a fighter. If you catch if you catch these hands, you'll know how good my striking is. Uh, 
and we've, we've showed glimmers of hope in our striking and we don't need to be a good striker. All we need to be is a good jiu-jitsu practitioner and we've showcased that as a light heavyweight. We've beaten some of the top grapplers in the light heavyweight division. And then we obviously beat Munoz, who's a very high level grappler. So when it comes to showcasing my talent, like I've already showcased that. How many, how many guys' arms has he broken? And uh, last question for me, there was a big light heavyweight fight last week and I know you're not in the division anymore, but what were your thoughts on that title fight? I always keep my eye in that division because that's where I, I cut my teeth. And as I get older, maybe there's an opportunity for me to go back there. Um, when I'm looking at these guys and I'm, I'm seeing their groundwork, because I'm, a, I'm very much a jiu-jitsu practitioner, I see opportunities and I'm thinking, right, they're very dangerous at striking. They're very strong. They're very powerful. But their ability to jets with the best is not there. Um, and it, it, it fills me with hope. Thank you. Hey, Paul. How um, you doing? 16, 16 fights in the UFC, first main event. How does that feel? I had no idea it was 16 fights in the UFC. So it's uh, it's time flies. Um, I've had more fights in the UFC than I have outside the UFC. I've definitely cut my teeth in the UFC, learned my craft, improved my craft, became a much better version of a fighter, if you will. And I'm only getting better through every single fight camp. It's a great opportunity to be the first Scottish fighter to headline a card. Like That was one of the goals I set way back when I first started doing MMA was like I would love to headline a UFC. I would love to have the UFC title. And I think the other one was I wanted to be part of the computer game. Now, within a couple of years, I've ticked all the boxes. And then it's now about resetting new goals and then getting closer to that title. Like, I know it's close. I know I'm in the mix. I'm, I've been given an opportunity. But what you can't do is look past your opponent who's standing in front of you. If you look past and be like, right, I'm going to get this guy, this guy, and then get the title, then then you're, you're going to miss the moment that you're in at the moment. So I need to be focused on Brendan Allen, who, as I said, very good MMA practitioner. But it all comes down to Saturday night. Is it even more special, like like you said, you know, you're older, you're on the set, you're the second leg of your career, you're in a new division. Does it just feel even more special that you're finally getting your first UFC now, or your first UFC main event now? It would have been great to do this as a 30 year old man and 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 cut my teeth a little bit earlier, but I appreciate things so much more. The fact that I am 35, uh, I reckon I've maybe got about six to eight fights left in my career, good few years left in there. So it's much better now that I'm a 35 year old man and I can and I can enjoy this kind of these this legacy I'm leaving behind for Scotland. Um, obviously, MMA math doesn't work, but do you look at like you finish Andre Muniz faster than than uh, Brendan did? Is is that did I did I, I I didn't know that. Um, I think he subbed him as well, didn't he? Whereas I stopped him with so the jiu jitsu guy didn't sub him, but the the striker or the wrestler. Subbed them. Um, MMA maths is one of these things. Like if we if we had to do that, then I would have been an elite heavyweight champ, which I'm not. Um, one it comes down to is come down to stylistically match up. Like I've watched a lot of footage of Alan Way's Jiu Jitsu, and I see he makes mistakes, but he also does some very very good things as well. So it's one of these things where like if he does this, I do that, and it's like. The, 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 the scene from The Hangover where Alan's sitting at the, the table and all the numbers are going through his head, that's what goes through your head at like when, you're wait, when you wake up at like 2 o'clock in the morning and you're like, right, if he does this, I'm going to do this. And, and you play out all these scenarios. And it's a really, really good way to... It's, it's visualisation. It's part of like the sports psychology that we, that we use to improve and, and, and be prepared. So you use it as a third person where I'm watching myself demonstrating what I'm going to do, and then I'll do it from my vision as first person. So it's a really, really good thing to, to use that MMA math and be like, right, he's definitely going to do this. I'm going to do this. Obviously, you're in a new division now, but like, how does it feel to to, to have wins over Magomed and, and Clive and Jamal Hill? You know, Magomed is, everyone believes he's probably the best light heavyweight not holding a title, and Jamal is a former champion. Just like, you, you have wins over both of them. How does that feel? It feels good, and it's like um, I can probably dine out on that victory against Ankalaev the rest of my life. People love that because 
we take a beating for 15 minutes in the last second, and that's all you need. It doesn't matter if you if, if you win the race in the last second or the first second, it's all about winning it. And people are like, aye, but you, you didn't win. But if you look at my record, I did win. So these victories mean so much to me, and especially if these, because these guys went on and done so well. And like When I think about the people who have fought in the top 10 of the light heavyweight division, like Krylov, like Ozdemir, like Johnny Walker, I've fought the who's who of top 10 in that division, probably more than any other person in the light heavyweight division. So now when I bring that experience down to the middleweight division, like my experience of dealing with big, heavy strikers, heavy grapplers is, is through the roof. And I think that's what sets me apart for Munoz. Like he's fought middleweights and he trains at a really good gym and he's got all these skills. But has he been in there with guys who are much bigger than him, guys who are much more dangerous than him? When you think about Jamal Hill, the champion, who has some of the best striking in that division, you think about uh, Krylov, who's got some of the most dangerous jiu-jitsu in that division, and then you think about Ozdemir, who's no time Ozdemir, who's got that power, Johnny Walker with the power. Like, I've hung, I've maybe not hanging with Johnny Walker, but I've hung with these guys. And uh, it, it's, it's experience. And uh, I don't think he's got the experience that I've got. Obviously, you said you're not really looking past Brendan, but is Bo Nichols still on the mind? Well, it's one of these things, like, Bo Nichols, one of these guys where he's got a bit of love. People are respecting his wrestling. And he's like, I can't take anything away from his wrestling. But there's other guys in front of me who I would love to fight. There's, as I said, 35, eight fights. I want to get as close to the title as I possibly can. 2024 is going to be a year where I'm going to get three fights. And I'm going to get closer to that title rather than shooting back. And I don't mean it to be disrespectful to Bo Nickel, but if you're not in the mix and you're not fighting regularly and you're not in that top ten and you're not working towards getting to that belt, then I don't really want to share the octagon with you. I want to share the octagon with the guys who are in that top ten, top five. Guys like Hamza Chimaev, who is one of the the best uh, middleweights we've seen. Skill-wise, he obviously put a pace on uh, his last fight against Usman, and he, he looks great, but I believe my skill set against these guys is, is different for everybody else in the division. That ability to pull a submission or that ability to lay heavy ground and pound and win a fight is what makes me different for all the other middleweights. And I've always wanted to know this, like, during during fight week, you're so calm, you're so nice, but when you hit that face-off, you're it's mo one of the most intense face-offs in the UFC. How do you get in that mindset just for that moment? It, it, it comes down to the crowd. It comes down to like what you're feeling in, in with the emotions. It's a very emotional game, being a UFC fighter. It's highs of highs and the lowest of lows. There's the, the added ability of not having any calories. There's the water uh, manipulation. There's all these kind of things. And you need a little bit of fire. And I think it's I think it's great. I think it brings the best out in me and it brings the best out in my opponent. They normally do one or two things. One is they allow me to impose my will and impose my frame. Or two, they decide to come at me and that makes it so much better. And that gives me that little bit more fire. And that's like, yeah, we're going to get this on Saturday night. And even when it comes to that Saturday night, even that when Bruce Buffer calls my name and I'm walking to the underground octagon, the centre of that, controlling it, imposing my will. Same again, it, 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 that's the stuff I love about this sport. I love the victories, but I love all these wee kind of moments that, 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 that will last a lifetime with me. And finally, <clears throat> for, and then finally for me, is Braveheart the best war film ever made? Braveheart the best war film ever made? Oh, that's a toughie. Uh, no, definitely not. It's Lord of the Rings. Has to be. <laughs> Love it, love it. Thank you. Thank I want to ask you uh, about one of your teammates and training partners, Stevie Ray. He recently called it a career. I mean, he said he's going to stay around in the game coaching the kids. You know how he's doing? Yeah, he's doing well. Um, he he obviously had fought in the PFL twice, um, a decorated UFC veteran as well, like one of the best Scottish fighters we've ever had. Um, but he's obviously taking up some, some wear and tear through his knees, and it's probably the best time for him to leave the sport as MMA. But fighters never stop fighting. They're always fighting for something, be it working with kids or be it working for uh, BJJ. Like, we've seen him, he's got, a, like, he's got an amazing victory over uh, Paddy Pimlet with a, a flying heel hook. 
I'm not sure if you've seen this, I'm sure it was on Polaris or one of these high-level grappling shows where Stevie Ray puts a pace on Paddy Pimlet and uh, he's going to do the same. I think he's fighting the same night as me. Still comes in, still got rounds with him. He's now went from being uh, in the 80s to being in the high 90s because when fighters stop fighting and they've stopped with that focus of needing to make weight, needing to watch their calories, they kind of just like to eat and 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 that's what Stevie's been doing. So he's been a really good training partner for me in this camp with regards to size and a body and the ability to, to roll with Stevie's a, it's an honor. That's great to hear. And uh, I saw you said that you ticked off a lot of your goals that you had when you came into this game. I'm assuming one of your next goals is to maybe possibly headline an event in Scotland or do something out there with the Yeah, that, that's like the ultimate dream for me is Scotland. I've fought there, I've fought in Glasgow once and that was, UFC Glasgow, and it resulted in me getting knocked out. That was my second, sorry, my third fight in the UFC. I was very green. I had very little experience of fighting in an octagon in front of a crowd. There was a lot of issues going into that fight camp. Like, I get knocked out, there's nothing you can say about that. Like, it's just one of these things that I was, I had no idea what the UFC was. And round about after my second and third fight in the UFC, I didn't think I was going to be a UFC fighter. I didn't think I was a, the caliber of a fighter that should be in the UFC. And then after my final fight on that contract and getting the victory over Ankalaev, it resulted in me then having a little bit more confidence. And then each contract, each fight, my confidence is building, building, building to now, as I said, being an older guy in the division with the experience and the... Uh, the, 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 the time to hone my craft, it's, it's made such a difference. But to go back to Glasgow and rectify that loss would be a dream come true. Um, I'm hopeful that within the next couple of years, I'll be headlining that show and there'll be a poster with the blue background, with the salt tire, with my face painted the way it is. That's like my ultimate dream now, is to hit that. I would love to have the belt, but that's going to happen first before I get the opportunity in the belt. Awesome. Yeah, with the UFC traveling back, I hope it can happen. Thank you so much, man. Hey, Paul. How you doing, man? Yeah, good, thanks. And um, with you were saying earlier on the show that um, you're the first Scotsman to headline a, a fight night here, and with Tom Aspinall's recent uh, championship win and Leon Edwards being a champion, what kind of does that say about the strength of UK MMA at the moment? Yeah, UK MMA is well behind in the US. The US have got this because it's most of the events are all USA based, so they have reasonable times to watch it. And I think that's one of the downfalls in UK MMA, because we, we maybe get two or three cards a year that are a reasonable time, be them in Europe or be them in Australia or Abu Dhabi, wherever they are. But when you watch them, how they're meant to be watched in a crowd with fans, discussing what he should have done, what he could have done, how you would have done it. That's how it's meant to be watched. I was lucky enough on Saturday there to see Tom Aspinall win the belt in a pub in Las Vegas, surrounded by fight fans, and the place erupted when Tom won. And, it, and it's like, that fills me with hope. And the fact that Tom's a champ, Leon Edwards is a champ, we've got some cream of the crop rising in Europe as well as the UK. I believe there's opportunities for a huge card in the UK, an arena tour, maybe like a stadium, get all these guys over, numbered event, sells out, and it pushes the sport to the next level in the UK, because that's what we're needing. People, the, the, the sport has grown from strength to strength in the UK, but we're needing these big shows like the Leon Edwards, London card, like the Molly McCann, Paddy Pimlet, the after lockdown London card, but they need to go to different places. They need to go to Manchester, they need to go to Birmingham, they need to explore the whole UK. And I get the fact that the UK doesn't have the, the events like the US does, but sometimes it's worth to take a hit in the pocket to push a brand and make it massive in, in another area. I was going to say, because you fought at the O2 Arena quite a few times, and it just seems like uh, the, we've heard from Dana White and I think Dave Shaw that the UFC, 
they feel like the forte is with arena shows, but we know they've done a stadium show in Australia. Yep. Um, you know, sh surely it's only a matter of time before we get a, you know, a stadium show at the, like the Millennium Stadium, Old Trafford, or yep. the Tottenham Hotspur Stadium. You know, would you want to kind of push push for that as well? Because we've got so many big stars over in Britain that could, you know, if they were, you could even have 15 matches and they'd all be household names. Yeah, when I first started getting into MMA and watching London cards or the Manchester cards, we only had one or two people on these cards, like Michael Bisping, and the cards were not built with UK fighters. But now when you look at post-lockdown and you think about the, U, the UFC London cards, they've been stacked with UK talent and it's just pushing that brand. So, yeah, I'm looking, I'm looking forward to seeing what, it's going to happen in the UK, and I'm a, I'm on I'm on the wave of this. I'm one of the last guys that will, that will be part of this because the next generation of guys that are going to come through is going to be a well-established UK scene. Speaking of the next generation, it seems like there might be a bit of an open goal for UK MMA because in British boxing, um, like the bigger fights and bigger names are fighting in Saudi Arabia and, and not in the UK. Anecdotally, do you think there's more like Scottish kids, uh, you know, Welsh, English kids turning to MMA rather than UK boxing? Because UK boxing might not be delivering in the UK, even though it might do in Saudi Arabia, not like UK MMA is. Well, if you think about, I grew up in the 90s and we had some of the greatest boxers of all time coming out then. And I'm not saying the guys aren't great, but we had the best fighting the best. Whereas now there's guys who are not fighting, who should be who they should be fighting in their divisions. They're maybe going about jumping about, catching all these different weight class belts because there's so many of them. There's the, I'm not saying corruption, we're judging and all this kind of stuff, but there's issues in boxing at the moment and it's kind of festering in a way. Whereas if I'm a young up and coming guy and I'm seeing this sport of MMA where there's so much more f like elements to this, I might not be the best striker but I could be a really good jiu-jitsu practitioner, I could have done judo. There's all these different elements that are going to make, that makes the sport of MMA so much more appealing to the next generation. Whereas boxing's kind of, I'm not saying it's dying because it'll never die, but it's, it's, it's went for being this massive sport in the UK or even the world to now kind of taking a back seat to MMA because MMA is putting on the best cards. When you think about a boxing card, you've maybe only got about two or three fights that you're like, oh, I'm really interested to see this fight. When you think about MMA, from start to finish, these cards are well matched and it's the best fighting the best. You want to see the number one guy fight the number two guy, then that's what you're getting. And you're getting that week in, week out. You're not getting that every once every six months. And then there's this new thing that's happening in the world of combat sports where you're getting two guys who can't fight fighting. And that's ridiculous. People are paying money to watch two amateur they're not even amateur fighters. Two stars fight each other for the purposes of they they believe it's entertainment, and it's 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 destroying boxing when you think about the YouTube stars who are fighting each other or the celebrities that are fighting each other. It, it's, they're they're just killing boxing, um, and it's just going to push the brand of MMA UFC to the next level. Well said, thanks, Paul. You mentioned. Uh about how you want to make a push towards the title. You want to push the one last one. He's in the UFC ranking. He's 10, you're 13 right now. Is just getting a win enough to sort of propel yourself above him, or do you really need that definitive finish or win to really get into that top 10? Yeah, every time you fight, if you go, if you just go to the judges, that's not entertainment. This sport, first and foremost, is about entertainment. The, the fighting element is an add-on. You need to be entertainment. You think about the guys who are jumping divisions. You think about how Jamal Hill got his title shot. He's entertainment on the camera, off the camera, regardless if he's fighting or not. He's an entertaining guy, and that's why he managed to get that jump. And the same for um, when we think about Sugar Sean. Like, he wasn't naturally next in line for the title shot, but because he's entertaining, he jumps the queue. You think about uh, like Tom Aspinall jumping the queue, like all these guys who are entertaining and putting on performances get an opportunity. So it has to be a performance. F going five rounds on Saturday night doesn't cut it to automatically uh, get yourself into the top 10. Putting on a performance, getting a slick submission, getting some heavy ground and pound, getting a knockout, that's what gets you in that mix. It's not about 
the victory. It's about the element of how you get the victory. And last one, me, silly. Like he said, we've seen you for 16 fights in here. It's crazy because when we first saw you, I don't think any of us could understand a word you were saying, and now we hear you, and, <laughs> and we have no problem hearing hearing you at all. So, did we take? Did we ruin your accent, or has your accent just sort of colonized to America a little bit more? So, I think it's a bit of both. I think one of the things I had to do was slow my accent right the way down. My accent, I still believe, is relatively the same, but I've just slowed it down so you can actually nice. pinpoint the word, and it's like, right, I get it. But then, <laughs> see, when I speak to my, like, my Scottish friends, I'm going to speak to this, and they're like, I, what you up to today? I'm going to go to get, like, they, they don't understand, isn't oh. it? They're like, huh? But no, I'm, I'm definitely becoming more, it's only taken me 16 fights. <laughs> one of you, I've, I've, told, I've told this story before, but um, when I fought in uh, Sao Paulo, and they were doing the in-ring interview, and they were like, right, if Paul wins, um, we're going to get a translator. And they're like, sorry, what? Um, and I said, I was like, no. And they said, well, they won't understand you. I went, you're not translating from Scottish to English. Like, I'm going to say, I had a really good experience. This guy's going to be like, he had a really good experience. I'm like, there's no home hell that I'm allowing you to, to, to give me a translator for this. This isn't happening. But no, it's, um, it's been some journey when, when you say 16 fights. And I think somebody tweeted the other day saying there's only been 400 people have main evented, have, have been the main event. So 400 people, and I'm one of 400. So like I, these are all the things that, that I love about this sport. It's about being, being the first to do something or having the, the UFC game or being one of the Panini cards or headlining and doing all these kind of things for the first, I love. And representing Scotland, like the UK scene is obviously getting bigger, but the Scottish scene, I want to try and push that and I want to be the guy that's, 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 that's the MMA fighter for Scotland. It's funny you mentioned the trans. I don't know if you remember this story. Once after your first fights, I found you in the airport yep, and asked I do you. Remember to, it. I it played the video and I said, "Can you tell us what you were saying?" I know. Right I remember there? it. I do remember it. You come up to us uh, and you were asking what what it was I said, and it was like, I was like, I said, and you're like, like you still didn't know what I was saying. So it's it's it's, it's, it's funny, but I have I've, I've definitely slowed right down. I remember looking back at one of my interviews and I was talking about John Jones, and I'm just, I've obviously got a little bit of elation for the win, you know, there's all this pressure being the, the first time you fight in the UFC and I'm just rabbiting on and, and I can just see people like shaking their head at me like, no, nah, no idea what's going on here. <laughs> can you teach us uh, some slang? Some slang? The, the, my, my, the, the one this, all the Scottish guys use is I. We use I, like, so well, I is yes. So like, um, are you going to tonight? I. Well, I knew that. I watch Outlander. Come on. Uh, well, I've never seen Outlander. <laughs> what? I've never seen it. You have to go to your hotel and watch Outlander. And watch it. I think I'll be uh, doing much better things when I go to my hotel than watching Outlander. <laughs> um, <laughs> that sounded dirty, didn't it? <laughs> you're, you're amazing in the gutter. If you've got a lady friend with you, she'll like Outlander, and that will help for other things in the hotel later. Oh, does it? Right, right. So I need to get a lady friend, and I need to get uh, some Outlander on the go. I got it. Can you do can you do an American accent? I can do my um, I've got a few accents I can do, and uh, every time I do it, I, I can like see people cringing. <laughs> um, so one of my favourites is Arnold Schwarzenegger. Like, oh, you got to get to the chapel. You must drink the monster. You know what I mean. Um, another one I can do is uh, well, I think I can do them. I, I've, I've actually never listened to myself and thought. That sounds terrible. Okay. The other one is uh, Christopher Walken's. Hey, you gotta. It's been up my ass for two years. You know this. <laughs> the monster. You know, sometimes you get it right up in there, and it's good. You know. And I'm like, and then somebody's like, hey, it's up my ass for two years. <laughs> And I think that's pretty much all my accents I can do. Can right. you do one of Dana White? I don't know, but so people always ask me, they're always like, Paul, what is Dana White like? And I'm like, I've only ever spoke to Dana White like a handful of times, but he reminds me of Tony Soprano. He's like, he's like, like when I see him, I'm like, that's Tony, that's the, the, the boss. Um, but I, could, I, could do, I probably could never do a, a Dana White, and I'm probably going to walk off here, and if I did an accent, I'd get, I'd get huckled. So no accent at Dana White. But uh, cheers, for the, cheers for the time, guys. That was That's good. Thank you.
you I just wanted to say, uh, you mentioned the Panini card, the, the main event, all that good stuff. I think you're the first guy to have the war paint at a media day. That might be a first, too. It is. That's what they were telling me. They were like, they've never ever done that before. So this is the first time that somebody's come up here and uh, and done it. And I did all the pictures. So all 